Welcome to the Transmission Coaching Podcast, powered by ATRA. Today's podcast is sponsored by Gears Magazine, your magazine for the automatic transmission rebuilding industry. Be sure to get into Gears. Get your free subscription at gearsmagazine.com. Click on subscribe. And don't forget to hit like and subscribe to the Coaching Podcast. And now here's your host, Coach Lance Wiggins. Welcome to the Transmission Coaching Podcast. It's a great day to fix transmissions. Today's topic is what's working and today we have a special guest, ATRA CEO, Mr. Dennis Madden. Welcome. And our uh, Roger Bland from Gears Magazine. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Good to be here. Good to be here. So last week, uh, our, our friend Tom Cheddar was here. We were talking a little bit about the expo and, and some of the things that shops are doing to become and stay successful. And some of those comments that came from our podcast we posted on social media was, what exactly is what's working? So from the founders of what's working let's uh let's get into where that this bit. came from is uh back in 2006 roger and i were whiteboarding some thoughts and we came up with this idea what if we were able to take the demographics of a city and the surrounding areas the size of the shop look at successful shops and build a road map so that someone could fill in a questionnaire and when they gathered the results, they could they would get a blueprint of what type of business would be successful for that area, and we found out that it didn't work. <laughs> Failure. Me, meaning that what would, what what do you mean by blueprint? It, 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 so that if you were, for example, having a business in San Antonio, and the uh, median income was eighty thousand dollars or what have you. And we found that the most successful businesses had four bays, uh, five employees, they offered these services, and go down the list of these criteria that we could, we could duplicate that in other areas. That now, was the goal. Yeah, in other words, if you could just take a book off the shelf and say, hey, I, I'm, I've got a business in this part of the country, and I have this many bays, and have this many rebuilders, and well, let's just find the blueprint. Let's find the ingredients I need. To so be if successful. it works for me, it could work for yeah. We'll just we'll just ninety nine percent of the population will follow a in the same demographics. Yeah, got it. It was demographically oriented. Understood. And we were pretty naive. We we thought, oh gosh, we we got <laughs> we found we got it. this figured out. We just have to send it out there. We can we can just put it out there, and everybody will find it, and it'll be the end of the story. And, and well, one of the observations that we had was, regardless of what city we visited, and there were a lot of them, we'd find a business that was doing really well, mm -hmm. and right down the street is someone ready to go out of business or dead. And so the question was, what are they doing? And we equated it to a demographic ingredient because we'd hear things like, well, you know, there's no business in Colorado Springs. I heard that one. You, you know, there's no money in Colorado Springs. You can't, you can't make any money in the transmission business in this city. And so that was the avenue that we chose until we realized, wait a second, uh, it really doesn't matter where you are. You're going to find a shop that is really busy. I think that's the best part about doing you know analytics like this is when you when you you find something you go a direction and you go wait a minute this yeah this, didn't work something, something's wrong we need to change and, and you're still running along the same path you just moved over a lane and then you look back and you look back and you keep checking your checking your data checking your data and then all of a sudden you figure out that you know this isn't a demographics issue this is a owner issue it was an elimination wow. process we started it's an to, owner issue. we started eliminating yeah. stuff and we found what we called the truth and the truth of the matter is it's about you the the individual running that business and and got into we went areas. a little bit further we actually did a, de a demographic study where we sent out questionnaires across the entire country every single state was represented and uh, large cities small cities and when we recorded the success of the various shops, it was a flat line. In other words, it didn't matter one bit whether you were in a city of 500,000, in an affluent town, in a poor town, a rural town, none of that mattered. You found successful and non-successful shops across the entire board. It was a complete flat line. It was, it was really cool because it, it told us then that any of this business about there's no money in uh, in Stockton. Right. Doesn't yeah. work. You can't exactly. use that excuse. Well, you know, there's no money in uh, Oklahoma City. That doesn't work. <laughs> no good. So so how did or how is 
or how would you think the owner who's listening to this might might think about what you just said like it's the owner i mean self reflection is sure something you do after the end of a season you know for coaching after the end of a project you know you completed a project you have self reflection we talked about that with the expo the presentations the five reoccurring traits yeah, and Roger exactly. developed those and so and so how how do you how do you think that you know well that's just it we started looking at all right Let's look at these successful shop owners. What are some of the traits and characteristics that these successful shop owners have that maybe the ones that are struggling or the ones that aren't quite as successful don't have? And we came up with the five recurring traits and characteristics of the most successful shop owners in our industry. And they are attitude, vision, plan, and goal setting, processes and systems, hiring the right people, and being a what we call the person of action. Pulling the trigger. Yeah. We can go through each one of those, Lance, if we have time. And, well, and I think really attitude the, speaks for itself. Like, you know, if you love coming to, to work, yeah. I think your your attitude reflects that. If you love dealing with customers, your attitude reflects that. If you are if you are a, a, a you know, an introvert <laughs> yeah. that doesn't like people, yeah. you're not you're probably not going to be a very good uh, service rider. You yeah. know, you're bugging me. I'm busy type of thing. So I'm sure attitude kind of speaks for itself. Now, there is one other aspect, and we could boil it all down into this. It was the last question of our survey, and it said, or it asked, the purpose of my business is, and left it blank. And so they'd write it in, and a lot of it had to do with profitability, money, uh, providing an income for my family, something to do with the the net at the end. And then other answers had to do with the customer, to provide a service for my customer, to get my customers back on the road, something of that nature. And you could bifurcate it. All of them would go into one of those two categories. And then when we studied the success of those businesses, by far, those that were focused on the customer were well above those who were focusing on the product or the profit rather. Mm -hmm. And so what we learned from that is the profit is the byproduct, not the purpose, not the goal. So it's really important for your business that your purpose is centered on the customer and the profit then follows. And I think from a, you know, a consumer's perspective that, you know, when you go into a business that you're unfamiliar with and you see and feel that you'll you'll tend to go back to them yeah you know if you if you feel you know you're looking around hello uh, hello you know yeah <laughs> anybody key, key word there was feel and what we discovered is you can't fake this you can say well we're a customer centric organization but if you do things contrary to what customer centric really means customers will spot that out in a minute sure they'll understand that now this is they're they're more involved in the in the profit and the dollar here than caring about what my needs are well what so are you the, really can't fake it some of the simple things that stand out is what happens when a customer breaks down out of town and you'll you'll see this repeatedly the successful shops it goes to the top of the list they'll do whatever they it takes to get the customer back on the road they'll buy a unit it, it, it is important that this customer who is now inconvenienced a thousand miles away get back on the road and get their life back together where you'll see other businesses they'll hem and haw about the cost of the parts they'll do silly things like want the unit shipped back to their shop a thousand miles and they'll fix it now the customer doesn't even have a car right? Because there's no transmission in it. Yeah. They'll work on it. They'll ship it back. Meanwhile, the customer has been sitting there for a week and a half. In a, in a hotel room at best. A hotel oh, room, his car. which, you know, the shop may or may not pay for. The point is the customer was out of the equation. They're thinking about what is it going to cost me to fix this? Right. Another thing that you'll see that's common is how long does it take to get that job done. One of the studies that we uh, we did asked customers how long they thought a transmission, a major transmission repair should take. The most common response was two days, followed by three. 
And I remember uh, that, I was doing that's the customer saying the this. customer. Now, whether that's realistic or not is immaterial. That's what their thought is. Sure. And so how are how is the shop uh, addressing that issue to let them know uh, how long it's going to take? Do they actually provide that? Um, I did a presentation in St. Louis a few years back, and I pointed out this two day thing. And uh, and someone asked uh, two days. Or made a comment rather. Two days, uh, I got a job in yesterday, and I can't even get to it for a week. Hmm. And I said, "Well, did you tell the customer this?" Well, no, I didn't want to lose the job. It's this sort of behavior that that um, torpedoes businesses, and they don't realize it because they're profitability focused. What is that job going to earn the business? And there may be instances where the cost of the parts are so high that it would be cheaper for the customer, faster for the customer, or maybe the delay time is so much it's gonna take five days to get the parts where it may be better to buy a unit. And I'm not advocating that. Sure. I'm just saying that when you're focused on getting the customer fixed back on the road, maybe there's another option. Uh, I've seen shops where um, they realize it's gonna take a week because it's something that is unusual, it's gonna take some time to get parts, and they'll rent a customer a car. Yeah. Because really the fact of the matter is no one needs a transmission. <laughs> no, right? One of my favorite that's sayings true. is you won't find it on anyone's Christmas list. Yeah. Right? They, they need to get the kids to school, they need to get to work. So this inconvenience, it's, it's our job, it's the job of our members to eliminate that inconvenience and get their life back together. And a lot of times, providing them a rental car, which might be 15 or 20 bucks a day, does it. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, the two-day issue is a non-issue. If it takes a week, it's fine because their car isn't the issue. The transportation to, to have their life working is the issue. And so the successful shops think about it. In those and I, I think it's important too, Dee, that we we recognize that profit's an important part of any successful business. You have sure. to be profitable to sure. pay your guys to be to keep open so you can service your customers. We're not saying that profit isn't important, but if the focus, your sole focus is on making a profit, what we found with our studies, those guys seem to struggle. It's like a dog chasing its tail, where you have the guys who focus on the customer, the profits follow. The sure. profits are the byproduct based on good customer service. Profits are important, but without a customer, Profits are a moot point. And when you have that, that customer that is that is out of town, mm -hmm. the rental car really might not do any justice. It's more or less time, right? Time. And, and you know, like, because the guy's driving from point A to point B, 2,000 miles down the road, 1,000 miles in between, he gets stuck and broken, right? Well, Give him, you, you, you know, we want to get him back on the road as fast as possible so he can get back to his life. Well, in most cases, why are people 1,000 miles away from their house or let's say 500 miles? What are they doing 500 miles away from their house? Either uh, traveling or getting another vacation you know, vac vacation or, 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 or relocating. Or, sure. or they could be working. Yeah. You know, there's any number of things. It, it becomes even that more critical to focus on that time factor when they're out of town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big deal. That is a big deal. Um, when you mentioned demographic, demographics and success, right? Success is, it, it could be measured in a bunch of different ways. It could be measured in, you know, you're a one-person shop, you get five cars in a week, that's successful. In comparison to a four-bay shop getting 20 cars a week, that's successful. How do you, how do we measure success now? What is our, what is our, our data show us now and what's working like? How do we measure the success other than any of the things that we've already talked about? What we've used is, is something called the success metric. Uh huh. And All Roger right. came up with this one. All and right. uh, you know, how how do you measure success? If you were to uh, ask a shop owner that question, um, wh what is it? A dollar amount? No, that doesn't work. Um, what is it? And so, well, you can describe that. Well, it's just, it's it's a sliding scale, and and what we looked at was how busy was a particular shop, and how much money were they making. And we try to use very familiar terms like it, it's it's. Uh, it's so dead I'm thinking about closing my doors. It would be like a zero or a one all the way up to so busy I'm, I'm booking uh, work weeks out. 
and that was your your busy success. They metric. were terms that people understood. Yeah, yeah. I'm making a living. Yeah, yeah. And then on right? the success metric, I'm paying for money. My bills. I'm paying my bills. I'm making money. I'm making money hand over fist. I'm barely, you know, I'm losing my shirt. And then also deal. traffic. And in, in each of those, swamped, right, right. So how busy dead. you were and how much money you were making, each of those had a value, and then we would just take both of those uh, values, add them together, and that was our success metric. And then we added the factor of time. So we had called back some in our first initial survey, we would uh, leave about three or four months, and then we'd call back some of the guys that had a high success metric to find out, to check in with what they were doing then. Because we know you can be kind of all kinds of busy in the wintertime, and around summertime or maybe in, in fall or something, there's there's seasonal times where you go up and down, you, you ebb and flow. Tax like season, yeah, going back to school are. season, yeah, yeah, so Christmas season. <laughs> we wanted to get, over time, an adjusted success metric. And so when we reported our first findings, they were all based on adjusted success metrics based on time so <clears throat> are shops that diversify any better off than our specialty shops it's a good question yeah we found that that's not necessarily true and we saw a lot of that uh discussion on our what's working forum where uh shop owners claimed that you know you just can't make it in the transmission business any longer specializing in transmissions you've got to do general repair and other services and we found that not to be the case. Uh, there are shops that are booming in cities all across the country that specialize in transmissions. There are shops that are booming and failing that, that cover a range of services. So that, is, that was as meaningless, in a sense, as our demographics venture. It just didn't hold up to say that, you know, the most successful shops do all car. They do general repair or do a yeah. Yeah. This, That isn't the case. And one of the things that, that affected them was once they became a general repair shop, all of a sudden they lost their wholesale work. Or the referral. Sure, the referral yeah, sure, work. sure. Yeah, maybe because obviously they're taking money away from them. Right. In that sense. Yeah. Interesting. So what's working has been around for how many years now? Since 2006, so what, 12 years? Yeah. Oh, it's outstanding. Yeah. The 12-year anniversary is in order, <laughs> right? And we just completed a, another study. Yeah, we're coming out with a brand-new study that we'll be sharing at Expo this year on— Two of know, them. Yeah, both of them. We have the consumer study already in the books, and now we're doing the shop owner survey. Oh, outstanding. Yeah. How do you think What's Working, the What's Working platform, has changed the game? Well— I'll go first, Dennis, because I think the most important aspect of what's working really aligned with the mission of ATRA, and that is, you know, any trade association, it gathers the best ideas and you share them. And the essence of what's working is just that. What is working at this particular time in our industry? And how do we share that information? Well, first, got to gather it, right? And then you have to have a mechanism or a platform for people to come and share that information, whether it be a survey or a form or expo. And once that information is shared, it's for the betterment of the industry. So what's working in its pure essence is all about gathering what is successful in our industry at this given time and sharing it. Even if it's little points from each shop, everybody's going to get something. Somebody has something, you know? out of it. and in fact, if one of the big things I always hear at Expo or at seminars or uh, wherever we get three or more shop owners together, somebody always says something that the presenter didn't have in mind, or somebody was it was getting information from that person who also wanted to share something. You know, this is what I do. A great example of that. Remember um, Dave Riccio at Tri Cities. He had this thing where he had his guys look for things that they could do to the customer's car while it was still there, like, you know, the rear view mirror, the, the glue goes, you know, Find gets something bad. free. Find right. something free. And so he would, you know, fix that rear view mirror that was in that guy's center console. Or, you know, when your, your brake pedal uh, pad gets worn out and right. you start seeing the silver, put a new brake pedal pad on there. Smart. Guys don't see the transmission. They paid a lot of money for this transmission, but they will talk to their friends about that brand new brake pedal or that rear view mirror that now is back on where it should be instead of in the center console. Stuff like that shared at these events. You can't pop the hood and show off the transmission. You can't. It's, <laughs> Ooh, look at this new transmission I got. That exactly. doesn't work like that. And there's another aspect of what's working, and that is simply to uh, have the shop owner think of their business differently. So many of them got into the business as a technician. They're rebuilders. The purpose of their business is to rebuild transmissions, so they think. And you'll remember this exercise 
uh, Lance, when I did this about he's doing Obama, isn't he? He's pretty touching. Stop it he's, now. he's getting excited. Uh, when I went around, I oh the I, ruler. No, no, not the ruler. Thank that God. was another exercise. Oh, yeah, that was a <laughs> good Thank God you didn't bring that, that one up. <laughs> so I went around and, and asked everyone what the purpose of ATRA was. Oh, and to a person, it was a series of tasks. Mm. You know, we have a warranty program. We uh, have a technical service. We do seminars, et cetera, et cetera. But it was completely disconnected from the member. It was disconnected from the audience, the people that we serve. And that's when we developed the, the little tagline, get them in the door, get them out the door. The purpose of ATRA is to help members get customers and then to help them fix those cars so they can get paid. It's something that everyone here can understand. So if you take that into the shop, what is the purpose of that business? Why does Fred's Transmissions exist? And if it has anything to do with the transmission, they're off base. It's got to be something with the customer. So it'd be an interesting uh, exercise to go around to the shop and ask your builder and your R&R guys, hey, uh, Tony, what's the purpose of Fred's transmissions? And see what he says. And most of the people are going to instinctively think that it has something to do with the transmission. And that is the fatal flaw. That is where people get tied up into things that have nothing to do with the customer, the time frame becomes irrelevant. All I'm, of the I'm building widgets, right? They're building <laughs> widgets, and they and they make and they do the best in town too. They build the best they, widget in town. Uh, well, and there too, uh, when you get tied into the transmission and you look at these websites, there's all sorts of technical stuff in there that customers don't care about. They talk about all the upgrades that they do and all this stuff that customers don't understand they don't care about, yet the shop owner is as proud as can be to show all these parts and talk about all the work that they do. And they're so off base that, that, that it's much more effective when it talks about the customer and how, you know, what their experience is going to be and the service behind uh, their work and the warranty that they provide and the peace of mind, peace of mind that they yep. have. I was just going to say that. And include some, some tips on on uh, things that they can do uh, for surfacing their car. Even, they may not be interested in doing it, but they want to know what does that mean? What is a service? And, and so those customer articles, if you will, are huge to, uh, to get that confidence instilled in the customer. And, and, if, and if, the, if the customer has that feel, that, oh man, that felt great. Yeah. I'll, that $3,500, that $4,500 that I spent, God, that's good. <laughs> It's true though. I'm not kidding yeah. you. It's true. That is a tr listen. That is a true statement. I I am I am the attestment of that. I will not. If I walk into a place, I don't care where I'm at. Doesn't matter what it is. If I walk into a place, and I don't feel like I'm being you know taken care of just as a as a human, mm -hmm. you know, as a person, I I'll, I'll I'll pay the money resiliently. Won't come back. That's the last time I'll. Uh, one of the one of the the food places in in Ohio, it, you know, I sat there for for twenty minutes before somebody finally came up to me. There were it was the slow restaurant syndrome. There was two people slow in the restaurant, restaurant, and and by the time they got to me at twenty minutes, I said, "Can I get, can I get a a, a menu and, and place an order?" She said, "Sure." I placed a seventy dollar order. I got my family up and we walked out the door. After you placed the order, hell yeah, I did. All right, <laughs> sorry, but <laughs> I'm not doing it no more. Right, so yeah. you mentioned. Um, Something in your statement just a few minutes ago about a purpose, you know, a, a, a mission. You know, f f I think sometimes when we think about missions, you know, you got, man, I want to create this mission. Okay, let's go through the process of this. Let's get everybody involved, right? Let's talk about what we think the mission is. But I think of missions as core values of, of your business, you know. Your core value is to take care of customers. How would you help uh, shops if they haven't created a mission already? How would you help them, you know, uh, in in maybe some advice to give them uh, to create something like that? Well, it's, it's pretty simple. Keep it short. Focus on the customer and ask the question: Why are we here? What are we doing to help that customer? And uh, forget the transmission. I wanted to share a couple things with you if I could just get off track for sure. a moment. Yeah. And then I'll Heck bring yeah. it back. So a couple of my favorite anecdotes 
about how problematic focusing on the product can be and profitability toward that product. Uh, Eastman Kodak invented the digital camera. You know, they now they're they're relegated to third-rate printers and stuff like that. But back when that was uh, when they designed that, it was put on the shelf. And the reason it was put on the shelf was it was going to interfere with their film sales. The executives wanted no part. Are you kidding? A camera that doesn't take film? They weren't <laughs> trying to put the, us out of business. They <laughs> weren't they in did. the creating memories business. They were in the film business. Yeah, yeah. Or if you look at Blockbuster, yeah, they had brick and mortar stores where you would Netflix. rent DVDs yeah. and and video cassettes. And when Netflix came around and made that mail order, and then we're working toward a digital format, Blockbuster had a golden opportunity to buy them for a song, but it didn't fit their model. Are you kidding? We are in the business of of uh, of renting cassettes and DVDs in our stores. I mean, we've got we've got a thousand stores across the country. This is going to be devastating. So they declined it. And we all know what happened there. So that is why it's so important when you think about your business that you're not thinking about the product. You're thinking about what you provide for the customer and put it in those terms and in such a way that everyone in your business can understand it. That's why, to get back to your point, the mission statement or the catchphrase or the value statement, however you want to deem it, is short, it's simple, and it it is directed toward the customer. What do we do? What do we provide that customer? And it'll write itself. And, and, and along those same lines, Deep, when we started the What's Working program in 06, one of the things we did is we started to take a real close look at the progression of our industry from, say, the very beginning in the early 1950s until back in 2012 or even today. And what we discovered is that it, it, it's going through the cycle, the life product cycle or the life cycle of introduction and growth and maturation and decline. And Dennis really, we, we kind of whiteboarded some, some different iterations of the industry and we came up with three basic generations, as Dennis called them, and you can expand on that. Well, the first generation, starting back in the 50s until, oh, somewhere in the early 70s, to be successful, and it, it asks this question, what do you have to do to be successful in the transmission business? Generation one, you had to know how to fix transmissions. If you had a shop and you could fix transmissions, guess what? People had nowhere else to go. General repair shops would send their work to you. That was what you needed. Well, in the 70s and 80s, you had uh, rebuilders leaving their shop and starting their own business. We had a flood of transmission mm -hmm. shops. Everyone was rebuilding transmissions. There was a shop on every corner. But they didn't know how to operate a business. They were, um, they were basing their price on what their competitor's price was and dropping it by 10%. And at that same time in that, uh, we had the, the big franchises come on. Amco, I think, in 1968 and late 60s. They came in and they had more of a business plan and building a transmission was part of it, but they, they started expanding across the entire country and they had this nationwide warranty where the independents couldn't compete and so ATRA's Golden Rule Warranty was founded in 1968. It's kind of an answer to that expansion of, of the Amcos and the big franchises. So that was part of that generation as well. Right, so, so in generation two, the successful shops were those who knew how to sell. They weren't afraid of asking for their price. This is where Terry Greenhut, you know, guys like that were coming on the scene and teaching people how to, how to run a shop, how to ask for the price, understand what it really costs. To, the big picture. The, yeah. The you, big still, picture. you still had to know how to fix a transmission. I could do that for like 500 right. bucks, I think. Right. Yeah, yeah, 500 you, bucks you, sounds good. And the next thing you know, you lose money. Two, yeah, in yeah. Gen 2, they figured out, the successful guys figured out how to get paid for fixing that transmission, paid so they could actually run a business. And so that actually weeded out many of the low ballers and that sort of thing. And, um, and as that progressed, and remands came on the scene, and the internet came about, uh, there became options. 
you didn't have to necessarily go to a transmission shop to get your transmission fixed. You could get one at your general repair shop, as an example. So we call generation three creating a customer. This is where the customer focus comes into play. You're not focused so much on the transmission, but you're focusing on the customer need. And what we found really uh, interesting about this, while so many were talking about general repair shops taking away their business and the threat of remands, it became pretty clear that even though so many of our guys didn't realize it, the transmission shops were the ones that were in the driver's seat. They were the ones that had the options. They could repair the transmission. General repair shops couldn't do that. They could rebuild it. They could install a reman if that was a better choice. They could install a used unit. They they had all of the options More available. More options than, than right. Yeah, sure. And so those businesses that exercise those options options based on the need of the customer, boy, they just they just boomed. So generation three creating a customer. Fascinating. It's just fascinating. Yeah. It is. I it, it's it seems. It seems surreal to look back at the beginning of what's working and compare it to where we're at today. I mean, you know, you, I, I think e- even when we go to Expo and we sit there and we talk, I mean, we have the pleasure of doing the surveys and getting that information back beforehand. But I think that, that I, would be, I would be interested to see the very first survey that we sent out and then maybe send that same survey out again and see if some of those same shops have changed and what they did uh, to kind of prove the point. Yeah, that's what we're doing this year. And the, it's pretty much the survey that's being circulated now to the shop owners, pretty close yeah. to that original survey. And so we're going to juxtapose what happened 12 years ago, what's happening now, and some of those numbers. And for those of you that aren't on uh, the What's Working forum, you can go to go gearsmagazine.com and just there's a form. Uh, window, click on that, and then you can sign up for the Fix It form, which is technical, or the Management form, which is the What's Working form. It's free. It's free. It's and, free. And everybody likes free. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. That was uh, that was exciting. That was fun. Yeah, that was exciting. So thank you for joining us. Uh, joining us here at the Transmission Coaching Podcast. It's a great day to fix transmissions. So let's keep fixing transmissions together. Till next time. Mm-hmm.